Become a part of the Horton team. We're looking for welders, painters, assemblers, machine operators, cabinet makers, and other positions to build emergency vehicles that help save lives. Join us at our hiring event on Wednesday, January 18th from 2 to 5 p.m. at 3800 McDowell Road in Grove City. We offer a huge $1,500 sign-on bonus and great benefits such as 401k match, medical coverage starting day one, and much more. For more information on what Horton can do for you, visit careers.revgroup.com and search Grove City. This is Jordan Grace, and you're listening to the Social Suplex Podcast Network. BWB, this is One Nation Radio. You better get it right. Rich Ladder, James Boyd came to give them life. The Blackest Wrestling Podcast has come to kick all ass and drop it six feet if they kick it trash. Word, let me welcome y'all to something different. And if you dig it, man, you should let some friends listen. We be getting it in. This on the regular, dude. Ravish and flow, but this shit rule. See, James don't rap, so I had to break it down. The whole network, man, we coming for the crown. Raps in the columns, I keep them both covered Making the beats too, so the listeners can bump it Hit us with the rating, yeah, I'm saying it's a five Before you hit it, talk, bob your head side to side It's One Nation Radio, and this is the beginning It's Rich, and I'm here with James It's time to listen to One Nation You got to understand the power of the pyramid this is Mike Sempervivi from WrestlingObserver.com. Check me out on Wrestling Observer Live every day. And also check out your boys, Rich and James, on One Nation Radio. Uh, this is Kenny Omega. We're listening to One Nation Radio. Check it out, guys. These guys know what's up. Big Kenny Omega fans. That's all it counts to me. Goodbye and good night. Hey. Welcome to the January 9th edition of One Nation Radio. I am your host, Rich Latta. Solo this week, James is traveling. Uh, He's on his way back to America from Japan. Uh, I believe his his flight takes off shortly as I record this. I don't... uh, I don't know the the time difference still he's been over there seemingly like you know for for six months now but i still haven't figured it out but uh we're gonna have a great show here tonight we've got a lot to talk about Um, we're going to also be back later this week with one nation radio We'll be talking about Wrestle Kingdom. We'll be talking about the big AEW LA show. So uh, we're, we're coming at you twice this week. Um, the stuff I really want to talk about uh, today was like the AEW stuff. Uh, we opened up the mailbag and also the news of Vince McMahon coming back to WWE. But yeah, man, uh, make sure you guys are still checking out the FOH draft. Uh, we're still seeing people uh, give this thing rave reviews. Uh, we still got more people uh, supporting the show. So uh, if you guys don't know how to get it, we will have the link in the uh, notes of this podcast. Uh, if you'd like to make a one-time or monthly donation, hit us up on the red circle. Uh, always appreciate that. Um, this is <laughs> going to be a great show. Um, Vince McMahon has returned to the WWE. Um, and you know, if you guys don't know what that means, uh, he basically has con- concocted the scheme that I said, yeah, if he wanted to blow everything up and go crazy, he could do it. And I had no doubt that he would, uh, if, if he wanted to. But the fucker did it. Um, so <laughs> right out of the Wall Street Journal. So uh, uh, Vince is back. Um, and, you know, he's here trying to pursue a possible sale of the business. WWE said in a, in a news release um, that they basically removed uh, Joe Ellen, Lyons, Dylan, Jeffrey R. Speed, and Alan Wexler from the board. Uh, and what they've done in place of that is Vince has put himself back on the board along with George Berrios and Michelle Wilson. Yes, if those names sound familiar. Uh, you're absolutely correct. These people were formerly on the board. They had a lot to do with the WWE network being launched and a lot of the content direction um, that existed with that. And more importantly, nowadays, what they'll probably be looked at as are McMahon puppets. Um, people that will just, you know, do the whims of Vince on the board uh, whenever he needs like uh, you know full support of something. So of course you know Vince. This is this comes like six months after um, he had all the disc, uh, the NDAs get blown up essentially uh, multiple payouts to women. I think it totaled like around fifteen million dollars. Uh, you know this uh, this uh, 
you know, ranged from like sexual misconduct uh, to, you know, outright rape. Like this, this guy, I'm going to refer to him as alleged rapist Vince McMahon every time I mention this motherfucker. So this guy, <laughs> they, they put out this, this huge statement. They never like mentioned any of the um, misconduct or anything like that in this statement of, you know, that he's returning. Uh, they basically, you know, his grand, uh, you know, thing here is like he sent a letter and in December, uh, he stated his desire to return to the company and a lot of people acted like it couldn't happen for some strange reason. And, uh, there were reports from people who shall remain nameless, like immediately on this. And it was like, they were reporting that people didn't want him back and it's kind of framing it in a way like, please stay away Vince. And it's like, there was nothing ever stopping him from coming back. And I, I knew this at the time and I was like, yo, the only thing that's stopping him is free will from coming back. And I don't know. I consider Vince McMahon and Donald Trump a lot alike. I believe they're best friends. Vince was the single biggest donor. Do you think Donald Trump was trying to go quietly after this election? No, he's trying to run again. Vince McMahon was always going to come back. But unlike Trump on January 6th, Vince was able to be successful and get his uh, company back. So, um, they he he's concocted this grand scam to basically uh, say he's coming back under the guise of selling the company. Now, does he actually want to sell the company? Maybe. May, let's say he does, right? But he included this little line in there that mentioned that he would be unwilling to support any new TV rights deals. So he was coming back whether they like it or not as far as he's being the chairman of WWE, but we know what he really wants. He wants the chair, not the chair that's in the hotel room that you, that you go in, you take a picture of and put it on the timeline before you get to the business. Not that chair, even though Vince probably has one or two of those laying around. Um, this guy wants the head of creative back. He saw six months of triple H, uh, basically running like this show and, you know, he probably just went crazy. You know, he was frolicking around with this younger woman. Um, and he basically, um, you know, v had people showing up to his birthday. I think Brock showed up. John Cena showed up. Uh, you know, we saw a lot of people showing their ass about Vince McMahon these past uh, couple uh, months. And, you know, even this last whole year. Let's let's take it all the way back to when uh, Pat McAfee interviewed this guy. And we, we said that thing was a sham and a, 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 a snow job. Uh, when it was going on, and we covered it in full detail. Obviously, I did the the big eulogy for Vince McMahon. All that stuff still stands. We we packed Vince up on the FOA's draft, so that's also serious uh, audio that you guys should check out. But they came out here, or he's coming back now, and right in the middle of WrestleMania season, have we considered that this guy just wanted some time off? In that letter that you know he he sent out stating his intention to return to the board. He basically gave the game away. He was like, I believe I got some bad advice. And looking at it, you know, as far as like everything blowing over and it just wouldn't be this bad thing for WWE. The sad thing is he's probably right. Because the second Vince McMahon comes back on camera, we know those fucking drones and those idiots are going to bow down before him like the West Side Connection, try to turn this into this triumphant comeback story, even though this man framed it as a retirement, it's time to go, never address the allegations, anything like that. When alleged rapist Vincent Mann comes on air, it is your job, or I won't say you have a job, right? But if you listen to this show, right, I, I would assume that you... <laughs> You you either find our uh, our audio and our thoughts like engaging. You find them uh, some a, a way you might you may even be influenced by it, which is cool. You may be entertained, but <laughs> dealing with alleged rapist Vince McMahon, I feel like we should be able to call him as such. Uh, this shouldn't be the the grandfatherly figure returning back home, giving us our wrestling back and the geniuses here. Like you're gonna see a lot of fuckery the more this plays out. Um, and th this whole thing, like as far as like the sale thing, he broke the glass that a lot of people didn't think he would, and I don't know why they they got this false sense of security. And that not only goes for fans. 
uh, media members, that goes for wrestlers too. I was having conversations with a friend of mine and it was just like, yo, how could like wrestlers, if you're in the business, right? How could you not see Vince McMahon was still in charge? He didn't go anywhere. He's still signing your checks. He always owned the company. He always had the most shares. This was always on the table. And <laughs> there are people that have signed with WWE recently. There are obviously, you know, the the, the Triple H, um, you know, rehires have, have become a meme so much of, you know, they had the one fist, then they had the second fist, and then we were waiting for a third fist to pop up behind his head. Of all these people that he re- re-signed from, you know, everyone ranging from Bray Wyatt, who hasn't taken a sim- single bump yet on a, on national television, uh, to Hit Row, to um, just tons of other people. Filler, like Emma, we haven't thought about her in years, and she's back. Triple H is just hiring everyone back. Like, it's all good. And with Vince coming back now, yeah, I think these people, like, I, I don't know if they thought it was all sweet. Like, they thought it was gone forever. I don't know, man. I hope a lot of people didn't, you know, I I hope a lot of people kept their heads down and and just tried to try hard because otherwise, like, you know, it's about it's about to be, you know, a cleanup season. One would imagine Uh, William Regal. Brother. (laughs) Um, Tony Khan alluded to this on Twitter um, as far as. People treating him a lot nicer the last 24 hours, um, which was a good tweet. We And, you know, all the world's dumbest people got mad at him rather than uh, alleged rapist Vince McMahon returning. So um, seems like there's like some type of problem there. Uh, we have a lot of people in the chat uh, welcoming uh, various members of <laughs> the roster to their new professions. Uh, Hit Row, welcome to Dat Piff from Black Sabre Jr. Uh Bray Wyatt, welcome to OnlyFans, apparently, from Brew Haven says. Uh, Dragon Lee, ooh, buddy, he just signed. Io Shirai, welcome back to stardom. Man, there's a lot. Yeah, man, it's um, it, it's a lot of, it, it's going to be really bad, man, uh, as far as, like, you know, just how everyone, you guys know how this is going to play out. And, you know, this guy, his... You know, they were alluded like he's he wanted to come back to creative as early as last week. So um, there there were subtle, there were subtle hints going on of, of Vince like possibly already having his hands in the creative stuff. Usually um, on Mondays we'll we'll see a lot of previews or you know different things uh, going out. One thing that Triple H was good at, uh, and I'll get to him in a minute uh, during his time is like letting you know what was coming. There was some stuff advertised and all that stuff. Monday, there were two things that were uh, advertised. It was like Alexa Bliss will address her actions, and I believe uh, Austin Theory will speak uh, on Seth Rollins and you know this this injury. Nothing else. You know, to me, that is a sign of shows being rewritten. And who rewrites shows? Vincent, excuse me, alleged rapist Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Boy, boy, boy. Uh, so, you know, we, we about to see the switch up of a lifetime. You know, anyone that was, that was acting like, you know, the the thing they were, they were telling us Vince wasn't so bad. Then they were telling us, you know what, all that Vince was terrible. They had to lie and then switch it up for Triple H and twerk it up on the timeline and, and do everything they want. Now they got to go back to saying Vince is good. So, like, this is the stuff that that I live for when, when, I, when I use the app, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll use the, the bookmark button sometimes. And I had this, this thing that you guys may have seen if you follow me on Twitter where I'll say, bring it back to the light. And boy, boy, there's going to be a lot of bringing it back to the light going on. Uh, this man, excuse me, alleged rapist Vincent Man is absolutely disgusting. I feel like everyone should address him as such. And him coming back is not a real shock. You got to wonder about Triple H. You got to wonder about Stephanie. Um, not too long ago, Stephanie was thinking about hanging out with her family more. You know, attending to, to her husband. And, you know, they were burying her in the media. And then she was Vince. And then she was also on the board. Um, the Nick Khan thing. Triple H. There's a lot of moving parts here. This story uh, is almost like the gift that keeps giving, especially going into uh, the TV deal season. There are some people that uh, feel like Vince McMahon makes this thing less valuable. To Vince, it doesn't matter. He doesn't care if it's quote-unquote less valuable. He would rather be in the seat making less money than watching someone benefit while he's not involved. Um, 
so this is uh, a an, an evolving story, but Triple H, man, if you, if you're looking at this guy, you've been preparing for this job for probably like at least let's see when did NXT start? Let's call it 15 years. Let let's do that. 2009, 2010, they were doing like the NXT stuff. Let's make it a, a nice round number, you know, uh, and maybe even longer than that because you know we, he was sitting in on creative stuff as early as the 90s. Let let let's call it 20 years just to be safe. He got six months to run the WWE in his image, you know, uh, quote unquote. And what did we really get? We got some pay-per-view shows uh, that were positively reviewed. We got like Clash at the Castle. Uh, I think your our, your uh, average WWE fan really liked Survivor Series. It wasn't so much you know my my cup of tea, but the pay-per-views have been more solid overall. I would say you got some slightly longer matches. Got a lot of rehires. And you got like mystery angles, like people uh, showing up wearing hoods on their their face and getting carried off and doing stuff in the background while somebody uh, is doing an action right in front of you. To my knowledge, uh, as far as like what people are saying is hot about the WWE, right? They're saying it's the bloodline. What does Triple H have to do with the bloodline? That was going for him already. All he had to do was, oh, yeah, that was already running. Just let, you know, Reigns and Heyman and them do their thing. That was already in motion. After that, you got damage control. You're going to throw that at me as a success? No. Uh, <laughs> you're going to throw, like, uh, you know, like, you, you brought Becky Lynch back? Cool. What's she doing now? Uh, you know, you bring Charlotte back? That That's the answer? I don't know, man. It. You, you, you got some slightly longer matches. You got really no visual changes with the show. You got uh, Matt Riddle being booked as just an awful human being, which maybe is a reflection of reality. Um, <laughs> Sarah Logan, welcome to Fox News. That's great. Um, yeah, man. And you, you got some slightly longer matches. And if you're someone that, that, that was really hoping Triple H got his hands on this thing, I don't feel like you can be like, like excited or like or fulfilled or anything like that as far as like what you actually got and i don't think he's out of creative yet but it's a matter of time let's just say that like can can we at least like admit that like you let uh mercedes monet walk out the door because you undervalued her and you'd rather push charlotte and bring her back and win the title and you'd rather push ronda rousey these are the personnel decisions that you're making um, you, and you have, you, you, you set off all this chaos with the, uh, with the tampering stuff and everything like that. And you look at triple H and then it was like, man, this is, this is all he managed to do. Is this it? This was the big, the bastard plan, huh? All these years of prep. I don't understand. And you know, I feel like you gotta be let down, you know, by, by triple H. If you, you, if you were looking for a sweeping change, you did not get that, and I think wrestling fans deserve a lot more. Uh, Triple H purported himself as much more than that, the way he would run NXT. He was booking Gargano versus almost at times. That's what Vince would have booked, and I think this is something that, you know, I warned of where I, w- I would talk about, hey, man, Triple H... Who did he learn under for years and years? Yes, he's opened his his eyes as far as, uh, you know, what he may look for in a talent, may, who he may allow in the door, who he may even push, you know, in the developmental system. But at the end of the day, this man was trained by Vince McMahon since 1999. I think that really says it all. WWE didn't change all that much over the past six months. This roster's like working really hard like that's one thing you know on this show we always give credit to the wrestlers a lot of the WWE wrestlers when they show up on game day they're ready they're 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 ready like and and if you take the chains off them they're ready Becky's coming Bianca's coming Walter's for sure coming uh Sheamus you know when he's showing up ready to do his thing the brawling brutes that whole thing like these guys in the ring, Kevin Owens has been better. McIntyre, uh, Reigns for what he's you know trying to trying to pull off. People are loving this thing. In the ring, I'm I'm not giving Triple H the credit for their effort 
when they step to to the ring because these people will try hard whether Vince McMahon's in the chair, whether Triple H is in the chair, or whether Rich Ladd is in the chair, these people will go out there and bust their ass. So, when I'm looking for Triple H, it's like, I don't know, man. You, you got, I gotta see more. And it's maybe it's unfair that to, to really judge him because he didn't get to see. Through, he may not get to see WrestleMania season all the way through under his vision. Maybe he has some stuff set up that was all due to come together. But what we got. I feel like, you know, his his bright idea was to, to pull out war games. And it was like, that's not like WWE's match. War games doesn't belong to you, no matter how many NXT ones you've done. It's the fans don't quite like it doesn't quite. It's a it's a hard match to have. It, we talked about blood and guts on this show. We talked about this one. Like, I don't know, man. It, it, with Triple H, I, people thought he was the second coming to savior. And I can't, I can't kill him because, you know, I think he had a lot of stuff. Like, he couldn't just take the belt off of Roman Reigns and decide to, like, scrap everything. But he could have not started pushing Cross. He could have uh, not brought back Strowman, Wyatt, all these bums, essentially, that, that, that he just brought in. And it was just like, what are you doing? And I know he w- he wasn't really left with much because a lot of his guys and a lot of the best people that were in NXT, they're finding success elsewhere, like Swerve Strickland, like Kyle O'Reilly, even though he's injured, Adam Cole, who's main event pay per views, like I don't know, man, Keith Lee, like these are the people that he wanted to come back. So what he was left with were the bums, the suckers, the people no one wanted, like Sarah Logan. Trying to tell me this is a game changer. You know, Tegan Knox coming out here looking like 6'9", showing up. What? They ran out of pops. Ironically. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, man. Um, this was, you know, this news. And, and you know, I, I imagine people are, are asking, they're like, Rich, so like, are you happy or are you sad that Vince McMahon is coming back? I'm indifferent at this point because, yes, it sucks that alleged rapist Vince McMahon can just use his power the way America is set up for him to own this thing, and he gets to do that, right? But it's like, well, what did y'all dummies think would happen if he had the opportunity to do this? So it's it's mixed emotions on that front. One can only hope for the safety of a lot of the, you know, the the women that are in that company working. And, you know, there's a lot of people hoping that Vince doesn't go to the creative. Like, this is the one thing they're holding on to, right? I'm here to let you know. Vince McMahon did not upend his entire executive board just to be on the board. Vince McMahon did this to come back to the place where Vince McMahon thinks he belongs on top. Number one as the man that that's, that's all this breaks down to. And, you know, we can, we can go, you know, uh, we can go through every single layer of this thing. And it all comes back to this is a white man that (laughs) with a lot of money that, is not taking no for an answer. And ironically, that's how he got in this in the first place. So let's move on um, from Vince McMahon. Um, <laughs> I was going to talk about a little situation that, that happened on Twitter recently. However, uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, if you guys want to know, check out my Twitter. Um, not going to escalate it any further, but um, AW had a big show in Seattle. First show of the year. Uh, we got the new look dynamite, uh, red and blue colors. A lot of people saying it looks like WWE. I thought, I thought the building looked nice. It looked lit up. Uh, I like the new stage. I don't mind it necessarily looking like WWE. Just don't be WWE. Like that's, <laughs> that's all, that's all it, uh, you know, comes to on my end. So, uh, I didn't know WWE owned the colors red and blue. I didn't know they own laser lights. So, um, you know, it's a it's a thing. So uh, let's let's start at the top of the show. Um, we opened up with Ricky Starks versus Chris Jericho. So this uh, match 
was uh, before we, I guess we, we talk about this match, we got to talk about this crowd in Seattle. This is one of the hottest crowds that I possibly ever seen. And this comes on the heels of, um, you know, that Denver show, which the crowd was awesome. And then all those shows throughout Texas were Houston and, or excuse me, like Austin. And um, uh, I believe it was uh, Austin, uh, Dallas, San Antonio, maybe. And they came out here and, they were hot this whole thing. And like, this has been a nice like loop as far as like, you know, this isn't South Carolina. This isn't Buffalo, New York. Uh, th- th- this isn't these, these, these places that showed up apparently prepared for a funeral. Like this was all elite wrestling. Like this was what, you know, the, the, the company was built on hot crowds and, and, and great wrestling. And we got to this uh, here and this was Ricky Starks and Chris Jericho. And I was looking for a lot of the Ricky Starks. I didn't, I didn't think we really got to, um, I didn't know if we got a chance to review, uh, Ricky Starks and MJF, I don't remember uh, <laughs> really reviewing it or anything just because of like the uh, hectic schedule. I got co- I had got COVID again. There was like a lot going on. But um, Starks and Jericho, this is a total Jericho layout. Uh, I could tell lots of twists and turns in this match. Good near falls. And I liked a lot of what Starks was doing here. I And him winning the match, I had no problem with that. I thought that was actually a good choice. Jericho got a lot of wins uh, with the ROH title. Uh, Starks is a guy that's on his way up. And this was probably the most I've been impressed in the ring with Ricky Starks. Um, you know, still got a long way to go. They, they beat his ass after the match. Um, but before that, like, you know, they... Made you think Starks was going to get fucked. Um, they had, you know, the Jericho Appreciation Society out there. They didn't have anybody helping Ricky. And they did the bat shot and, you know, the subverting expectations. Loved all that. I'll probably go four stars on this match. Um, but the crowd, like, fucking loved this match. They were way into it. Um, <clears throat> this one um, basically ended with uh, Starks uh, rolling up Jericho, uh, or excuse me, hitting, uh, Jericho with a spear, uh, after, uh, Menard and Parker, uh, got dropped on the apron. After that, Jericho Preacher Asian Society, uh, hit the ring. They whooped Stark's ass. Uh, Action and Dreddy came out there with a the chair. He has a big eye patch on. He's also showing up to all these, uh, various charity events and indie shows with the eye patch on. So there's always an eye patch angle going on at AW somewhere. It seems like, um, uh, Tay Mello and Anna Jay came in, got the chair away from uh, Andretti, gave him a low blow. Um, and basically that uh, the Hager gave starts a power bomb off the apron through the table. This is eerily reminiscent of what they did to Eddie Kingston. So I don't know if they were conscious of that, if they were trying to, to mirror that, or if this was like, you know, just the same idea again. I don't know. But um, after that, uh, we had um, Tony Schiavone welcomed us back uh, and he brought Hangman Page out to the ring. Uh, Shivani mentioned that Mox, you know, is challenging Paige next week at the forum. Paige said, as of now, he's not medically clear. Crowd booed. Uh, and then he basically said, you know, if I don't fight or anything this week, I'll be cleared to knock Moxley's dick in the dirt. And I love this line. I didn't, <laughs> it's not often you hear something like that. So, uh, I will, you know, it, it was good fire out of Hangman. Um, after that, Moxley came out. He was surprised Paige was even here. He said he's sick of the sympathy cars. Uh, this is hard, tough man, John Moxley. Basically, like he's tired of the simp- sympathy cars and the the candlelight visuals for the the man that is not dead, Hangman Adam Page. Uh, there was some hijinks going on with the mic where the arena couldn't hear him. Mox starts flipping out, dropping f bombs, and you know basically gets it back on track. Said go Seahawks and all that stuff. And he, you know, Moxley mentioned something about uh, Page being mad at him for knocking him out. And Paige took the mic and said he's not mad about that. He, it's how Mox called him out, making him a joke. And uh, Paige said Mox was, was threatened. And he's got two in the chamber with Moxley's name on him. And it was going to take a shot at the forum. Uh, and then Moxley basically said Paige's punk ass doesn't belong in the ring with him this week, any week. Uh, and he's, he'll make sure he doesn't get back up. This was just real hard, tough talking from, from tough men and, and like guys that are like, uh, and they basically like they've set this program up really nice, uh, fr- from the brawls to, to the promos, to the backstage stuff. Uh, these guys like this feels like a real hot match going into next week. They couldn't save it for the pay-per-view. I wish, I wish it was on the pay-per-view, but these guys have been on a collision course for quite a while. And that last match that they had with the inconclusive finish, the knockout, if you will, um, that actually, I think added a lot to this. And I think it was like, it was just a, a fortuitous finish that, 
you were able to like tell this wonderful story out of. And um, I'm really interested to see who's going to win here. And I don't know who's going to win. Uh, I feel like Moxley's going to win just because Moxley's like really loses or anything like that. But um, with the the how they're being portrayed in this, I feel like Moxley's kind of leaning a little bit more like a little bit in the direction of he'll do anything to win. Page is kind of remaining honorable still. So, um, you know, they're asking you to pick a side. It, it's on you who you want, who want to cheer for here. Um, I, I'm loving, like, Page's execution in this program. Like, I, I think his uh, approach to being a babyface is so modern and so, like, like kind of new. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. Um, and Black Sabre Jr. says, two tough white men. Yes. <laughs> um, for sure. Um but after that, we got uh, Samoa Joe, Darby Allen video package as tonight's main event. They were in Seattle. And that was, uh, you know, everyone was worried about this show in Seattle and Brian Danielson in particular, right? But they forgot that they have not only, Danielson's not the only person from Seattle here. Yes, he's the biggest star. He's the person with the most legacy and everything like that. Swerve Strickland is also from Seattle. And then the man they built the main event around, their homegrown guy, Darby Allen, is also the the guy. Like, you know, and I think that was a um, a smart thing to do to, like, basically give all the Seattle guys that second hour and then end with Darby, who's been your guy since day one. Like, I think that's really smart. Um, but before that, we'll, we'll get back to that. The acclaimed take on Darby. Double J, J E double F, J A double R, E double T, Jeff Jarrett, and Jay Lethal. And they defend the AEW tag team titles. This was excellent. Insane heat. Uh, the pre uh, rap, uh, pre match rap stuff, Jeff Jarrett going ape shit and putting um, his foot in Max Caster's ass verbally. Um, this feud has just been a pleasant surprise and one that I just had no idea would be this enjoyable. This was, this is straight out of Memphis. And this is, this is a very old school. Like if you're going to tell me Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal are going to work in the tag team division, and just go up and down it. Jarrett has been a sneaky, great hire, especially like, you know, when you add in like his out of the ring stuff, like with the uh, business development stuff and the international stuff he's working on with AW. This looks like a steal. Like, if we're talking about people that have been hired from WWE as far as, like, Michael Mansbury, the the production guy. But Jeff Jarrett backstage. Everybody loves him. And if he's going to come in and work like this and then have these hot fuse with these up-and-coming guys, this shit owns. Um, they did a dusty finish in this. Um, this featured Matt Scasser doing Kurt Angle's moves. Uh, Jarrett just in full heat mode. Um, you know, daddy ass out there doing the scissor thing, getting thrown out. Um, and these guys are just working like this, like this old school match. And, it, and the crowd was molten, molten hot for this. Um, they, like I said, they did that, that dusty finish um, portion where um, Jarrett hit the stroke. Uh, of course, uh, that ended up le- letting Lethal get the three count. Uh, but, you know, his boot was on the ropes. And the cool thing here was Satnam Singh was getting thrown out. So Satnam Singh so big, they can't control the guy, essentially. All the refs are out there anyway. And this is where Aubrey, out of the corner of her eye, catches the, the foolishness going on with uh, uh, Sanjay Dutt knocking the foot off the ropes. And instead of her not being out there, like it was kind of like a natural thing, like that this ref would correct it. Like they they didn't run out of the bag and say, hey, we've got instant replay. We need to show nothing like that. This is like a quick thing. Crowd was shocked that the titles changed. I was sitting there like, no, they're not going to do this. And then I was like, okay, they're going to they're gonna switch it up here. And then like quickly after that, Double J was pinned, or excuse me, Double J was not pinned. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett's not getting pinned. Jay Lethal got pinned um, by by Bowens. So um, they won the match. That directly led to a rematch and, a, and a, or excuse me, a promo later on the show. Set up a no holes barred match on Rampage. I'm not going to cover that tonight, but um, these two teams had a hell of a week. And man, I I can't I can't like say enough about like what the like the acclaimed are coming out hotter on on the other end of this jared and lethal are are looking great uh a lot of people were looking for jay lethal to connect with them in some way maybe he's still not but you cannot say jared is not doing his thing 
I, I don't care what you think about Jeff Jarrett. A lot of preconceived notions about Jeff Jarrett. And the thing about Jeff Jarrett is Jeff Jarrett is not a main eventer. But anywhere else, Jeff Jarrett will be awesome, even at his his older age. Because, uh, like he said on this podcast, like you damn sure can't outwork him. Like he he's gonna like we're talking about working the room and everything like that. He's a master. He knows all the tricks, and he can get heat. Like people, you know, there's a lot of the the heat that's going on with MJF. Some of it is uh some of it's real, and then some of it is we want to be in on it and stuff like that. There's nobody that really want you know in in mass that really wants to be in on Jeff Jarrett like that here. But um, looking past, like, you know, being kind of a commentator on this, I can look at what he's doing. I really enjoy it and um, can't wait to see what else he does. So after that, uh, we had uh, Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker. They got interviewed about their match with Soraya. Um, Baker and Hayter call themselves the AW Originals, and Soraya just doesn't get it. She doesn't understand the company, which got a chuckle out of me. Um, she basically said, um, you know, Baker and Hayter, they worked their way to the top. Soraya just came here. She, uh, you know, was friends with the Carl Sheeta, Tony Storm. She can't make her decision on, you know, who her partner's going to be. Um, and Bader, Baker just basically called her, called Hater the Killer, herself the pillar. She basically said uh, also that she's the boss and winked at the camera. So a lot of people are wondering about the newly dubbed Mercedes Monet. Um, they ended up uh, with a pre tape. I'll just go into it now later on to where. Um, they were showing Soraya with Tony and Carl Sheeta. Carl Sheeta doesn't say a word. All actions, all just memes, vibes, everything like that. And Soraya chooses Tony Storm. So everyone's kind of like, what's going on here? Um, and the way they kind of did it was Soraya was kind of assholeish. Like she kind of just like turned her back on Sheeta, didn't mention her, really talk about her, kind of just dismissed her for Tony Storm who she had already had this previous relationship with worked with in another company so you know there's some people theorizing there's a you know the originals versus uh the outsiders thing maybe going on I'm all for that I think it, it works well and it felt like Sheeta was gonna be like oh hell no I'm about to get like it felt like the the obvious setup was Sheena Sheeta attacks Tony Storm either to take her out of this match or even after the match to, to where they're going to pair off at some point. But we are wondering like, where does Mercedes Monet fit into this? And this has been, uh, she's had a great week as far as like selling all those tickets for ballot battle in the Valley and looking like a really valuable commodity as some smart people told you she would be. Um, but it's like, where does she fit in here? Is she still going to be, you know, is it going to be a substitution? Is it even smart to do it this way? Is it, it's an angle, you know, do you need to reveal the, um, the, the person like, you know, and I'll just take it back to what like TK says, like they were asking him about this mystery partner on Grapsity. shout out to Will Reg and Phil. And he was like, it doesn't really behoove him to, uh, you know, to, to basically, uh, divulge that information. So, I'm going to kind of go with that. Um, you know, there are people that may think, you know, you need to like get her out there and then advertise it and stuff like that. And I'm like, all right, yeah, but there, there's more than one way to do this, I think. And I think it's like, you know, if, if you marry yourself to everything just has to be about every single rating, you're just bogged down and not creating kind of like either natural moments or whatever you're trying to do. Um, there are some people that have the theory about the tickets, like maybe she like, cause you know, when Soraya debuted, they didn't tell you it was Soraya. They didn't tell you anything. Like she just kind of like, wouldn't you have wanted to like promote her ahead of time? Anything like that? It's like, no, she came as a surprise after a match. I think that's the template they're going with here. And then tried to pop whatever her appearance is later on, as far as like, you know, she's in the ecosystem. Um, and you either use that to try to like put her on a pay-per-view or anything like that. Like, or, or you just do appearances after, um, that may be what they're going for because, you know, if she's like this star like that, I don't think, you know, like I, look, this show already has <laughs> the elite versus death triangle game seven, John Moxley versus Hangman hey page. I don't think there's going to be that much more like as far as like, you know, like the level they're going to be at and then what they quote unquote will miss out on if she's not uh, exposed ahead of time. Everyone's going to be plugged in. Uh, I think AW has got, got to keep doing them on this. Um, but after well, let, let's uh, go back in reverse. We had uh, 
Jungle Boy, Jack Perry backstage basically sets up a match with Jungle Hook against Big Bill and Lee Moriarty in L.A. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, I'm into the Jungle Hook team. Um, And, (laughs) yeah, and also Brian Danielson versus Kondosuke Takeshita. So, like, I I don't think this is, like, a a make-or-break thing on Mercedes Monet here. Um, But... What we have uh, here is Brian Danielson taking on Tony Nese. A lot of people upset at, at this Brian Danielson's missing Wrestle Kingdom to Wrestle Tony Nese. Da, da, da. And it's like, all right, man, um, let you know what else Brian Danielson is missing New Japan? He's missed every other event they've ever had. <laughs> he missed the G1. He missed like any other big show, too. Like, when he go, gets to New Japan, he'll get to New Japan. Like, Watch New Japan. You know, New Japan has their own stuff going on. Like, you know, and AEW has their stuff going on. So, like, was Kenny Omega going over there not good enough? Was FCR going over there not good enough? Did you need more white people going over there for you? I don't know. You tell me. But, um, Danielson and Nice, uh, solid match. Um, you know, just, just real short. Uh, Nice is a guy I love. I'm, you know, higher on these probably than most people uh, got got some good heat, and then eventually, you know, went down uh, via the um, the running knee, and then Danielson did the regal stretch, and the crowd just kind of looked at him. I feel like when Danielson does these regal stretches, the crowd just doesn't like either pick up on it. They're like, "Why isn't he doing like the yes lock? Why isn't he doing the 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 Blackpool combat elbows? Why isn't he doing the uh, triangle hold that he was doing? Why isn't he doing the knee? Why is he doing this other move? Like I, I still feel like people were doing this, but um, after that, he basically got on the mic. He said it's great to be home. He's feeling froggy. He's ready for another fight, and he basically was challenging MJF to come out there. MJF came out, called him Braden Damage Brian, and know Mark, and uh, he basically said he's a special attraction. He doesn't wrestle, so this is more of the MJF not wrestling stuff. And I don't know, man. You gotta wonder if if MJF has some kind of crippling, uh, you know, <laughs> does he have some type of debilitating condition that prevents him from wrestling? Like, is it does he have some type of frail body that that prevents him from lacing him up? Because I don't know, it's. It's not for me, but he basically said if Lance Malenko, uh, Lance, oh Lance Malenko, Jesus, uh, if Lance Storm and Dean Malenko could have a child, he'd be more charismatic than Danielson. Um, that was a that was a mean one, uh, <laughs> and he said he wouldn't be uh, surprised if Danielson's mother in 1981 opted for a goat instead of a human suitor, uh, and we heard the words human suitor more times than I've ever heard in my life because Danielson then flipped it back and saying all the boys in the back have fucked your mom basically and all these other people in the arena are all her human suitors and um I was un- I thought this was completely uninspired between these two um MJF said the title is what makes him the best and it, it gets better from here but that first part was like ugh. Um, after that we got, uh, he was basically saying, you know, he's the best in the world and the people that have been in the business, uh, he said what the people in the business call him the best in the world. And he named, uh, basically anti AEW, uh, Illuminati of Eric Bischoff, Jim Cornette, Disco Inferno, and all these other people. Uh, and he said the people that call you the best are the Mark journalists and people that have never been in wrestling and stuff like that. Um, and Danielson basically said, it's, you know, it's time to fight. Fuck all that. He hates MJF and, you know, he, he basically challenges him and MJF tries to set up, you know, the, the, Hey, uh, go through the, the, the levels to test me. But Danielson kind of sniffs it all out and says, forget all that. Uh, he basically has to win every match until February 8th. Uh, and after that, he will be able to name the stipulation. So he chooses an Iron Man match. Uh, MJF says that, you know, he snaps. He said, Tony Khan doesn't run the company. The EVPs don't run it. He does. And he'll, you know, you, you'll basically do what I say. Uh, he's there. You're trying to let me cheat in front of the ref. And this is before he unveils the Iron Man stipulation. And, Danielson's going to run through everybody MJF puts in front of him. And he said he's going to expose MJF and tells him he doesn't have the cardio, which is a, a real insult to to somebody. And, um, yeah, 
Revolution main event looks like 60-minute Iron Man match, MJF and Brian Danielson. Now, after what I've seen on Russell Kingdom, ironically, that night, it was like, okay, they're setting up MJF versus Danielson in a 60-minute Iron Man match. I'm like, if there's anybody I want to see doing a 60-minute Iron Man match with Brian Danielson, it is not MJF. No disrespect to his wrestling ability and anything like that. A lot of people were brought up. He went 48 minutes with CM Punk. And I'm like, yeah, when was that really that exciting? Was that some match that, you know, we're just like, oh, incredible. No, that was, <laughs> they worked for a long time. They, they they were in the ring for a long time. They weren't working for a long time. They weren't, you know, redefining the sport. Like, if you're wrestling 60 minutes in 2023, you got to be, up there hall of fame guys like that that's not what i'm looking for here um i don't know man um this is this is i'm not into this uh i i hate to say it danielson feels kind of like a weak challenger they're they're gonna heat him up over the next five weeks obviously they're gonna do him into catch next week that's gonna be phenomenal he's gonna go forward through you know hopefully a lot of cool opponents um but the destination doesn't it's almost like somebody said backstage like well brian wrestled the miz a lot why don't we have him wrestle mjf and then we'll do it we'll we'll do that stuff better than they ever dreamed they could do it but um uh, i mjf and danielson isn't a match that i'd want to see go 60 minutes sorry um you know and, and, and it feels like MJF is, is light on material right now. Um, and the further, like, we're not close to 2024. And the thing is, I feel like a lot of us have sniffed it out already. Like, he signed an extension despite what's going on. So we're not really even buying it from that angle. But if you're someone that is kind of hanging on his every word and saying, yeah, my contract is up 2024, that's 11 months from now. So you're sitting through this thing, this 2024 thing with him. And I feel like that's already like, I don't know if it's because, you know, I, I'm ascribed to the theory that he already re-signed. So none of it is like really landing for me like that. But if it's like 2024 and that's his whole thing, the war of 2024, that's a long time away. It's a lot longer time is going to feel like he's going through the paces of this promo. And I don't know, man, that's not particularly exciting for me but um if anyone's gonna save this in the ring it'll be brian danielson uh and mjf's no slouch in the ring it's just like we know what it is we've seen the the layout here we know that the the cheating stuff and danielson's basically doing this iron man match to combat the cheating where okay if you cheat you got to keep doing it but his plan is to over that 60 minutes kind of do it. And I feel like I feel like people are going to be furious. Danielson's not winning this match. Uh, I'd be shocked if he won the championship uh, from MJF here. I feel like the only way uh, MJF could drop the title is if like he just registers a bunch of disastrous ratings. But they don't let him wrestle anyway. So how can you really pin him, pin him on on him? So I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> that, that's, that's a lot here. But after that. We got Swerve Strickland taking on A.R. Fox. So Swerve came out, uh, slightly tweaked entrance music uh, with the mogul affiliates around him. This it, this was like a superstar entrance, I, I thought. And, you know, Swerve came out and the group like looked really strong as compared to um, their first appearance where everything was kind of haywire. Uh, it looks like, you know, like these guys have just been told, hey, man, look menacing, walk straight, walk around Swerve. Keep it basic. It's back to basics, it felt like, as far as the presentation. And I think it worked. Um, and then, you know, Strickland and Fox, they have a long history going back to Lucha Underground. Uh, this match is fantastic as well. Uh, a lot of stuff, this is awesome chance, holy shit chance. Uh, and this was a lot of, like, anything you can do, I can do better as far as the the – the flips off the apron back in the ring, uh, sweeping out, you know, the legs. Uh, there was a slingshot corkscrew brain buster, uh, Fox did. I love that thing. Um, there was like the pump kicks over the rope, somersaults and, 
Uh, just a lot of like one-upsmanship here. And, you know, you could easily tell these guys were familiar with each other. Uh, it was looking really pretty uh, at the beginning. And then it got like, you know, a little more physical towards the end. Um, they basically, you know, they did some, uh, like Fox did like a kip up in Seguri. That was pretty cool. Uh, it was a somersault cutter and Swerve like countered it into a German suplex and a flat liner. Uh, he basically gave uh, Fox like a crotch. He crotched a move out of the corner, but uh, Fox gave him a, a short cutter and uh, iconoclasm into another cutter. Uh, Fox was coming off the rope with a 450 splash. Uh, and then there was, you know, they were. Uh, they had uh, the, the tattooed guy who Taz started making up all these names for kind of took the referee's attention away, swerves on the top rope, uh, gets handed a gimmick by Parker, uh, hit him in the corner, uh, swerve gave him a Death Valley driver off the second rope onto the apron. That shit was crazy. Uh, and then basically rolled him back in, swerve out for the win. This is swerve real dominant over here. I thought this was a good win for him. Uh, and as far as like, you know, the group presentation much improved from the first time uh, would love to see Swerve and Fox run it again and kind of, uh, and, and take the, let these boys go out there and, and, and with them weapons. That's, that's what, that's what I think I want to see with these guys. So, um, after that, we got that Soraya segment that I mentioned before. FTR came to the ring, um, or excuse me, FTR did not come to the ring. It was time for the funeral of FTR. The guns came to the ring, and I was fucking dying. They put the FTRIP up there. They put the tombstones. They came out wearing black and looking sad. I pop for mock funerals in wrestling all the time, going back to The Rock holding the funeral for Steve Austin after uh, WrestleMania 15, I think, comes out. This man has no shirt on. I mean, he has a suit, and then he has, like, oh, yes, this this. Texas trailer park piece of trash lays the rest. Like I think it's pretty funny, but, um, he said, uh, they held all the tag titles except the AEW and there are 10 stars in their hearts. Ah, Swig of water for the working man. Uh, the guns said they destroyed their legacy, their 10 year legacy in 10 minutes. Uh, they basically play FTR's music. FTR had been at Russell Kingdom before this, so everyone was like, hold on, did they fly to Seattle somehow? They did not. The guns just laughed, and they said they're the new living legends. So this thing continues. Got a quick recap for the series for the best of seven. Uh, next week, uh, we've got the Elite versus the Death Triangle. And man, <clears throat> what a fucking series this has been. Um, these guys have gone with like, they, they, they got, there was a lot of people that said, yo, you can't do this. You can't do this best of seven. It will not work. People will be bored. You can't do the same match over and over again. I don't think they tried to prove you wrong there because they didn't try to do the same match over and over again. They kind of did this like progressively escalating story. No pun intended with the Escalera de la Muerte, where it ended up in a ladder match at the end. And looking at the falls, how they laid this all out, it was like they didn't really beat people like to where it was like, oh, okay. Like there were um there was a uh, Meltzer driver pin in game five, I believe. Um there was a pin from the one wing angel off of like a whole gimmick in a stage to beat Ray Phoenix at one match. There was a reversal of a, of a move uh, of Pack, you know, doing his shooting star uh, deal and went into the knees. There was hammer shots in the other match. So they've kept this, like, everyone's strong. There's not a lot of people doing, like, just clean one, two, three jobs. Like, Kenny got hit with the with the uh, hammer in game one and all that. But it leads to, to this ladder match. And this is going to be incredible. Um, we, we, we saw what, what Kenny did in the Dome. Like I said, we'll get into that uh, when James gets back on the show. I kind of want to organize my thought. I know it's been, you know, five days since Russell Kingdom, but you guys can wait a, a little bit longer for, for the Dream Team to come back together for that. But, um, yeah, man, uh, this is going to be excellent. And they basically, everyone that said they couldn't do it, they proved them wrong. And I'm very excited about this. Like, this is going to be a defining match. And I can't, for the life of me, wrap my head around the thought of wanting someone to screw it up. All the fantasy booking. All the, what if Adam Cole returned to cost the elite? 
what if various person from injury comes out? What if CM Punk comes back and, and while such and such is on top of the ladder? And it's like, who detached us, man? We got all these six matches, right? Fire matches, right? Various like levels of clean or not wins, right? We want to see someone win at the end, I would think, right? But apparently this is this is not the case for a lot of people because this is like Russoism that has, has ran rampant rampant in wrestling. This is WWE brain. This is just it always has to be about moving something forward. No, man. I want to see who's better because that's like what a best of seven series is. We need to see who wins at the end. We don't need to see such and such fuck somebody out here and then they just they're up the creek. They they had these seven matches for nothing. No, man. Like when um Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose were beating the shit out of each other in that Hell in a Cell match. I did not want to see Bray Wyatt bring his fat body out there and start a few with Dean Ambrose. I wanted to see who was the better man. Straight up out of those two. And I want to see who the better trio is between Death Triangle and the Elite here. And give somebody a clean win. Essentially. Like a, as clean as you can get in a ladder match. So, I don't know man. I think this is a whole like, like, like thing. It's like bro, like. It's just like, yo, like, let, let, let's look at these comments here. Um, you know, Crystal Fisher says, six completely distinct matches. Black Saber, I think Death Triangle wins. Uh, Adam Yuri, nah, bro, the Elite are going to win and feud with CMFTR. He is kidding. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, like, oh, man. I, I like the point of a series, I think, is to see who the better team is. I don't think we need to. Fuck somebody at the end of this. I think it's stupid to think like that personally. And it's like, no, that's not, it's not why I, you know, got into the company. So, um, but yeah, man, um, let's keep going. Cargill and velvet against sky blue and Kira Hogan. This was standard match. Nothing really notable here, uh, except red velvet walking out on Jade again. So they're furthering that story. Um, I wonder how people feel about Red Velvet possibly being the one to beat Jade. Um, I always thought that would be a nice full circle thing. Uh, Velvet was gone for a long time with injury. I don't know if she's necessarily been built up in her own right, so maybe that's why they're taking their time with it to even if they're going to explore that option. They want to give her a little bit of something to stand on, even if she does lose that match um, going into it. I feel like, uh, you know, that injury, if Red Velvet wasn't or wasn't injured and she was doing stuff to really win the crowd back over and stuff like that, she would be someone to look at to, to end Jade's streak. But I, I, I wouldn't do that now. Um, we knew the, like, we had heard of the plan to, to have Statlander be the one to, to take it off Jade. So Jade's almost, like, she's in overtime, like, with this belt right now. And uh, I think a lot of people are starting to, you know, Tap, tap the wrist like, hey, man, what are we doing with this? And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, to Red getting a shot and they, they get like an extended match. Uh, by all accounts, Jade and Sky Blue actually had a solid match over on uh, Battle of the Belts. So um, can, you know, they get the interest level needed to get Jade and, and Red Velvet into um a, a program to where people want to see Jade win or excuse me, red win. I don't think people necessarily want to see red velvet win. It would just be cool because of the full circle nature of it. She was the first person um, that was in the streak, but Jade has kind of been blockaded off from a lot of the division with the TBS stuff. She's kind of been in her own world. So um, we'll see how that goes. But after that, we got Darby Allen and Samoa Joe. Now, this wasn't as uh, this wasn't as good as uh, their first match. However, it was still awesome. Like I mentioned, um, Seattle guy. This is the guy that this company started with when you know they didn't have Swerve, they didn't have Danielson, right? The guy for the Northwest for AEW was Darby Allen. We always thought it'd be special when he when he got a chance to go up there, and boy was it. Nick Wayne sitting in the front row. Um, I'm sure Brian Alvarez is hanging out somewhere around there. All these guys are kind of connected. Really cool moment. It's hugging them before the match and everything like that. And um, this crowd just came unglued for this match, and they really made this like a really special moment. I was very happy for Darby Allen to win it. I feel like Darby's the 
really the man with the TNT title per, to me personally um, that that just felt like you know he he deserved like to to have that run in front of fans. He was such a great champion, developed into a a reliable ratings draw with that championship before. Uh, such a great storyteller, such a great um, just uh, you know guy that takes a lot of punishment, beats himself up for us, and I don't think that can go um, without mentioning. He basically makes Samoa Joe. He he takes fifteen years off of Samoa Joe's age. Uh, I don't know what it is, but Dar- Joe must fucking love wrestling this guy. Um, and <clears throat> at the end, Darby picked up the TNT championship uh, with a coffin drop, cleans the sheet. Um, our top two champions are MJF and Darby Allen. Um, and <laughs> you know that's that's not a bad uh, that's not a bad uh, set, set of champions. And you you look at AEW uh, today celebrating their four-year anniversary of the uh, press conference and all that. And it's like, man, these guys came in. They were at the bottom. They were in, like, you know, the the pre-show battle royal. I don't even think Darby was on the first show. He he got bumped to the second show. And looking where they've come up, and, I, you know, we got a question that's going to, like, uh, kind of uh, talk about this a little bit. But these guys have been allowed to grow into the wrestlers they've become. Uh, as far as status wise, from day one, there's been focus on each of these guys. They they didn't send MJF out there with a mic to rip on Bret Hart for no reason. They didn't put Darby in there with Cody for no reason. Like these guys are both long term plans, the pillars. Uh, and you know, going into it, you know, I want to see both of these guys like start mixing it up, like with a lot more of the top of the roster. Like, uh, like I, I want Kenny and Darby for sure. Uh, I want Danielson and Darby at some point. Um, you know, MJF has, has been, uh, you know, kind of sequestered away from, you know, your Kennys. And uh, he's been in there with Mox before, but and he's been in there with Jericho. Uh, but there's so much, like, talent up and down this roster that I don't think has had a chance to come together yet because of, you know, the pandemic, injuries, everything else that's out there. There's just, um, you know, with those two, there's great matches waiting for both of them. So, very happy to see Darby get it back. I thought Samoa Joe was excellent um, as far as, like, the whole King of Television run. It was short, but um, it's a secondary championship. It's not – he no one has to hold it for six months. It doesn't need to be held for a year or anything like that. They did, like, a little solid Wardlow thing on the inside of this thing. They saw that last Darby match get over, and um, I think, you know, TK kind of looked at Darby – Kind of had a light 2022. It was a light year for him. Were there injuries? I don't know. But he, he was left in tags a lot. He was not a main focus. And every, he felt like he kind of got lost. But he's back. And he's back in full force. So let's go, Darby. Run it back. Let's do it. I'm fired up here. So, um, yeah, man. After that. Let's get into our questions. So we have, man, let's see. Let's let's see what we got here. I want to thank everybody for, for sending in their questions, first of all. Um, I'm going to take another sip of water. So, first question. We're going to go with Black Saber Jr. He says, with the report that Stardom is trying to work with other companies and freelancers for a show in April, what is a Joshi dream match you'd like to see? For him, it would be FWC versus the Magical Sugar Rabbits or Venny versus Mayu Iwatani. Hmm. Okay. Um, a lot of my dream matches kind of involve Takumi Aroha. And I think she's wrestled a lot of these people. So I'm going to remove Takumi here. <laughs> um, so I'm not as familiar with the rest of the Joshi scene as, as you know, for example, as James would be. However, um, I will take the route of like, I want to see some doors being knocked down. If it's going to be this super event that they want to draw a lot and they want 
maybe to show some reverence to the past. I want Aja Kong coming to stardom. I don't care how it has to happen. I know Rossi and her don't fuck with each other, but I want Aja Kong to come in, work an undercard tag with somebody. It can be anybody on the roster. I don't care who it is. But um, and then I want the photo op with, with Rossi and and Aja Kong. That's my dream match there. Um, number two, and who who in your opinion is the funniest wrestler alive? Um, okay. I find Double J absolutely hilarious. And I don't think he's trying to be funny at all. Um, I also find Kenny Omega hilarious. If you watch his entrance to Wrestle Kingdom, where he <laughs> he is turned around, he puts the arm up for the one-way angel, and then he, like, leans around. I'm going to turn around in the chair. And he has this look on his face, and he's like, I'm back. And, like, his eyes light up. Like, that shit's absolutely fucking hilarious. Um, I, I've clipped the video already, and, yes, it, 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 he's, he's fucking hilarious. Um, number two, the next question comes from Keeping It Strong Style, the young boy Josh Smith. He says, Kenny is back from injury and suspension. With the trio series wrapping up and the Wrestle Kingdom match ended and reports of a potential punk return, what would you personally like to see out of and for Kenny Omega going into 2023? I'm glad you asked. So, um, I would, I think this ties into what I was saying earlier with MJF and Darby Allen. These guys have kind of been allowed to kind of grow into those top positions. And I think it's important to switch up the card enough to where new people are allowed to be tried for like a six month block at a time. Right. With Kenny having that uh, IWGP US title would be a way to kind of keep him in his own Kenny Omega division, kind of like it kept Mox in his own John Moxley division uh, when he had that. It's, it's booking protection to a certain, uh, you know, stance, but it, we already are seeing like, you know, I like I want to see them win the, the trios championships and, and stay in that trios and, and really make that solid up until probably about double or nothing, I would say would be a... A, a, a good run for, for the Bucks and Kenny to have those trios bells, and then the Bucks can break back off into tags. Kenny can break back into singles, and during that whole time, he can just be defending that U.S. belt, whether he's he's making an appearance in New Japan of America or, you know, taking it back uh, to Japan itself or defend the belt in AEW. Um, I want to see people, you know, get imported for him to face. I want to see him against some of those guys that he hasn't faced. I, I don't want any rematches aside from Chris Jericho. I would love to see in Winnipeg for the U.S. title, Chris Jericho versus Kenny Omega. I think that's I, – they should write that in pen right now and start advertising it for um, the return to Winnipeg. But, um, you know, it's going to be really hard for him to get that wrestler of the year. I'm sure Will Ospreay is not planning to take any days off. Um, so, between – the 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 years that Kenny Omega has, have have really thrived in my opinion have been when he's you know got a chance to quote unquote rest in like tag situations and he basically you know just comes in and you know acts like one of the cosplays as a, as a you know as a great tag wrestler for like half or, or or quarter of the year and then you know he just fires off a bunch of singles matches against whoever and that US title is like kind of perfect for that I would assume there's a big singles match for Bendor, a uh, Dominion appearance. Um, I wouldn't even put a G1 out, out of out of question. The only thing I would say is I don't think the the schedule will allow Kenny to do a G1 at this point in the AW. Um, he's going to plant. I'm I'm sure he's going to be wanting to make up for a lot of the time from that he missed from last year. So, <sighs> final answer, Trio's run up until about double or nothing while defending that U.S. title, you know, most of the year, possibly getting into that AEW title scene around the all-out. Uh, and then with CM Punk, I mean, I, I don't know if he'll be back. A lot of people want that match. I'm not clamoring for it personally. Uh, but if it happens, cool. It, it'll it'll do business. Um, <laughs> and it'll, you know, it, it'll be something that a lot of people are looking forward to. I'm sure the promos would be excellent. And I think Kenny would surprise a lot of people as far as, you know, with his promo ability. But Punk obviously would be no slouch in that area. He would just really have to hold his own. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the wrestling. And I am not a person that enjoys watching when Kenny Omega has to wrestle down to the level of his opponent. That 
I, I saw that enough uh, when he wrestled Cody. But, you know, a lot of people want this match. So, um, you know, maybe another AEW championship at the end of the year. But I'm not, like, necessarily – um, clamoring for that. Although his performance at Russell Kingdom did make me think otherwise. <laughs> I'll say that, but, um, let's keep going. So Rambone slam pig says if Carl Anderson pulls Tamatanga and or Hikaleo back to the fed with them, how does that affect your thoughts on the finesse of the year campaign for 2023 early front runner? No, nah, not really. Because like this just rolls, that would just line up with WWE's mission of like just signing the guidance of, of new Japan. It's not. I don't think Carl Anderson would necessarily be a recruiter or anything like that. I don't see how he would really benefit from that. Um, you know, I n- nothing really there uh, as far as an early front runner for Finesse of the Year. Uh, I, I don't think I could. We can't write off Keiji Muto. Still, I'm sorry. We, we can't. Um, uh, also, Rambones, what's the worst take you've seen on the Omega and Osprey match? I'm sure some people were trying to say it was a spot fest or something, but anything really unhinged. I think I saw some asshole on Twitter, uh, rather public, you know, account guy that you know is is pretty popular in the lexicon. Uh, I think he gave this a three and a half, if I'm not mistaken, and I saw someone else. Also, you know, kind of very popular video essay man gave this four and a quarter. I don't think I've ever wanted to smack somebody for rating a match that, you know, the disparance, the discrepancy from like, you know, what everyone else literally in the world thought it was. And then like what these two people thought, um, there was someone that they, 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 I mentioned gave it four and a quarter and three and a half. And I just got to say. You should probably stop watching wrestling. Like, if this is a three and a half star match, no. Like, like what wrestling or are we are we missing out on? The rest of us missing out on. Why are you holding back on us? Um, I heard um maybe Cornette had some positive stuff to say in between just totally ripping uh Osprey and Kenny down. So you know, shocker there. But um, yeah, um. Uh, Brewhaven says, uh, or Brandon, Brandon Candia says, um, what is your percentage on Vince fully taking back over this year? 100%. <laughs> he did take back over. He's the chairman. And, um, and it was like, yo, man, um, we know he wants what he wants to do. I don't think he's done all this to not take over. So 100%. Okay. Someone named Parker St. James at Royal Magic Show says, What did you think of the Kid Bandit Twitter lore? Does wrestling need more lore? And if you had to pick out one positive aspect of Bray Wyatt's current Uncle Howdy lore, what would it be? I'm almost offended that you would assume that I know any of the Uncle Howdy lore. What about me, Rich Latta, says that I am some sucker that follows the Bray Wyatt bull jive. What about me in my audio history since 2013 tells you that I think of Bray Wyatt as anything other than a con artist and a scammer. The Ben Simmons of professional wrestling. We'll go back to your questions. What do you think of the kid bandit Twitter lore? Okay. I was sent something from a friend of mine today that had the Kid Bandit Twitter lore on it. So I'm going to read it off for people that have not heard it, right? And I don't really know what I think of it yet, but maybe I will get a um, a thought here. So let's find uh, Kid Bandit's lore here. Uh, going through a lot of stuff here. Make sure you uh, get your merch, get your merch. Okay, I got it right here. So, in wrestling lore, Ken, Kid Bandit is a corporate android created by a shadow organization named Bandit Corp to infiltrate the pro wrestling industry, use propaganda to create a following, analyze pro and profile professional wrestlers, and integrate their fighting styles to the profile of a super soldier, which... They will clone to create an entire army. 
every big name in the wrestling world that she's ever interacted was by design because Bandit Corp was trying to analyze them. She wasn't designed to win. She was designed to lose and record data. However, the program that was inside the android and data that got corrupted during its confrontation with Malachi Black, it broke free of the original programming and is now a rogue AI in the digital space and leading the resistance against Bandit Corp via sabotaging the corporation's propaganda. Their old body has now been repurposed by Bandit Corp to hunt down the old program, their associates, and the resistance she's building. Okay. With, like, the old body and the new body, there seems like there's elements of, like, the Terminator or something in there. But I think this is a cool story for somebody. Personally, I don't need all that. I need people to tell us why they want to fight. I need people to fight. I need people to be prideful about their work. I don't need an entire backstory lore for to to enjoy your match. Um, it's cool that someone may uh, put this much into you know their their craft and their art. This is how they want to express you know what they do in wrestling. Not gonna bang on them for that. It's a little out there, but you know. If you want to come up with a way to uh, cover for all the matches that you actually lose, right, and do and enough people get into it, sure. I I don't think this is any worse than any of the Bray Wyatt stuff, honestly. Um, wrestling, and to his other question, he says, does wrestling need more lore? I think wrestling needs more logical like reasons to invest in people rather than um is I, I think people need to be believed in more like i think they need to take advantage more of all the tools they have like social media say what you want about kid bandit kid bandit is trying to reach like a certain type of fan right now the number of those fans like we don't know you know, who's out there, you know, with that, but like, I could see people really being into that. Right. And buying into it, buying merch about it. And you know, that, I don't have any problem with that, but like, just like for me and my taste and like what I like about wrestling, I don't need all that. So, um, Ed dead, which of the four horsemen would or four, excuse me, which of the four horse women would have thrived in the attitude era WWE. I feel like this is really easy. Um, this is Charlotte Flair all day. One, she has the Flair name. That's going to be like, <laughs> that's going to uh, be good in any era of wrestling, essentially. The other three, they weren't trying to do serious wrestling back then. So the other three will automatically struggle, right? Charlotte, however, uh, we know what Vince McMahon likes. He likes blonde, big titty white women. That will never change. Um, and that, that, that was true in 2012. That was true in 2016. It was true. Now it was true in 1998. Why would it be any different? Um, Bruce asks if the tag team one nation radio was being booked to split up, who would turn heel rich or James man? Man, this is a, I feel like this is a question for the chat. <coughs> chat, who are you turning heel and, and who are you turning baby face on, on this? Like, how, how do y'all want to see it go down? Because I don't know, man. I, I feel like I could cut some fiery baby face promos. You know, I I could cut heel promos too. I, I, I feel like I can do whatever, you know. Uh, Lothario Negro says rich going heel. So, you know, if I'm a heel one in the chat, if James is a heel two in the chat, retrogram, you're heel 100%. This dude, James is a belly stand. Okay. A lot of people saying I'll turn heel, man. So, uh, I'm being cast as the villain here. Okay. I'll be the heel. I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and come up with all the, the wacky shit. 
Uh, if I'm going to be a heel, I'm going to be like Kenny. Like, <laughs> it's going to be execution, you know. Uh, and I always have the joke, uh, if if I ever, like, wrestled any of my friends or anything, we had, like, a backyard promotion. Uh, Ryan Hart, Rich Heel. Man, y'all just beat me down with the heel, man. Damn, what, this, this, this is what they think about you, you know, like Ice Cube says. But um, I always tell them I would have no problem putting them all over. I would love to put them all over. Like I don't, I don't want to beat any of my friends, you know. So, uh, you know, I I learned about like how how to really like digest wrestling, and how I really felt about like the the performers um, through loss. Uh, I grew up a really big Shawn Michaels fan. He lost a lot of matches after that. Um, uh, you know, after that title run and even before that title run, he was losing a lot. So I, I learned to watch what he did in defeat. And that really was the stuff that connected with me. And sometimes it was as a heel, he would do that. Uh, and sometimes it was as a baby face, but, uh, and I feel like I would employ that. Uh, Adam Yuri says rich defense, double J. He's a baby face in my opinion. <laughs> so he, he must be messing with me, but <laughs> that is cool. That is cool. Um, yeah, man, it's, um, interesting there so let's go to the discord let's see the questions we got there we got dr larry the dark uh he says more likely to hold a wwe championship belt tony khan or the rock Hmm. okay so this is a tough question for me because i mean some of y'all know but i don't know how many of you guys know i don't watch the nfl uh, I don't know how good the Jaguars are. I saw they won the division on Twitter, and Tony Khan, uh, you know, jumped into the guy's arms, dropped his phone, and stuff like that. But I don't know if the Jags are actual legit co- contenders or anything. Um, you know, I ever since the Colin Kaepernick stuff, I have sworn off the league. I've, I've still haven't, you know, broken that. It's been five, at least five years now. The Rock, we don't know if he's uh, actually going to show up. To this thing, every other report like puts it, um, um, like, like it seems like you know, there's always a backup plan being talked about, whether it's Cody Rhodes or you know, if they're gonna du- dust Brock out of mothballs or something like that. But, um, I- I'll just take a shot in the dark and say, Tony Khan, why not? Um, Adam says the Jags are not real contenders, they're, they'll beat LA and then lose to his Chiefs. Okay. So um, I think they just gotta they just gotta pray for some type of miracle run. So I I look, I'll root for the Jags to win just to see how Tony Khan reacts and and how nuts he goes. Like Tony may go insane. So um, and you know if, if the Jags are in the Super Bowl or something, right? I'd assume you know the whole roster would would go out there and. Uh, be attending the game and we might get some, you know, we might get some good wrestling content out of this. So I'll go with Tony Khan. Why not? Um, and he also asked our uh, last question. He said, is AW's ratings, uh, or is AW continues to have low ratings? Do you think Tony Khan actually makes changes or does he stick with his formula that is netted diminishing returns? Uh, they have had a couple ratings of late that have been low. Um, and some of those ratings like have come with like heavy competition and stuff like that. I think that is uh, a dangerous game to play if you're just you know isolating uh, individual weeks. I think ultimately they're they're in an area like where they're fine. I don't think this is a um, you know a situation to where everything's in free fall, you're scrambling. I say just keep telling your stories. The crowds that have shown up to these shows these last like month or two. It seemed like they've been really happy with, with AW. I think the fan base has been really happy. The numbers are going to be what the numbers are. And I would continue to just, you know, do what you're doing here. Um, you don't need to get desperate or anything like that. And I don't think Tony Khan actually really has a history of ever getting desperate. Um, he, you know, they had the, the situa- situation where he snatched the book. But, you know, his real major move was like, all right. Um, we'll take a week off like that. The, the network mandated us to, and then we'll come back and then just start rolling out fire television. That was the adjustment. So like, I don't think the television is necessarily like any worse or anything right now than it was like, say, you know, January 1st, 2020 into like revolution. Right. I feel like the, you know, like we're getting, you know, shows where, uh, like new year's smash, right. 
you're getting like three three matches that are like four and a quarter on there. Like you're getting this show next week. Let's take let, let's take a look at next week, right? And tell me if this is something that you would not do. You have the Elite versus Death Triangle, Game Seven. You have Brian Danielson versus Konosuke Takeshita. You have John Moxley versus Hangman Page. If this these are things you should not do, I want to know what you actually are supposed to do because. As I mentioned, the numbers are going to be what the numbers are. You just keep booking, you know, for your fans and, you know, the networks. Like, they'll tell you if something's wrong. Like, I don't think this is a situation like ROH where it's like, yo, there's this fucking albatross on, like, the the show or anything. Um, But, yeah, man, um, looking at it going forward, I I think they got to uh, just stay the course here. So... Besides that, uh, man, I think we are at the end of the line. A little bit shorter uh, on the episode here uh, today for One Nation Radio. Um, But we have a lot of cool things going on at the beginning of the year. As I mentioned, we're going to be back Thursday to do the whole Wrestle Kingdom review. Going to talk more. uh, James has more stories from Japan that he's been uh, dying to talk about in the show. Even I don't know them yet. Um, we also have the one nation radio awards, which you can still vote on Uh, a lot of stuff, uh, going on in those awards. We went over the up to date kind of handicapping for that. Uh, I believe the, uh, keeping it strong style awards, um, will be, uh, you know, getting wrapped up shortly. Uh, they'll, they'll be debuting those. Uh, they just did a pretty cool wrestle kingdom review on there. And, um, from there as i mentioned foh that is still available um and we are just about doubled last year's uh donation so many thanks to anybody that has donated uh whether it was a dollar whether it was fifty dollars whether it was 150 dollars like that is all very appreciated like we when we put those things out it's like (laughs) <laughs> it's like we don't know necessarily like what the reaction is going to be because we do so much stuff just like off the strength and off the love and everything like that and then uh for you guys to like kind of pay it back to us uh it was really cool to see and we appreciate it for sure uh bruce says better way in uh you'd be a great heel with the cigar and the camera zooms as you cut promos yeah i always have the cigar ready so i guess i would have to have the cigar to smoke the pack uh, uh on my opponents and you know things like that but um, that is going to wrap the show up uh, for tonight. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, you guys know where to find all the shows, uh, everything that, that's here between us and keeping it strong style, all things elite, um, and also um, Danny's shows uh, and, you know, uh, all the archive material. I'm here just off the top of my head uh, looking at it. Let's pull out the official list so um, I don't flub all the shows here keeping it strong style one nation radio all things elite keeping it strong style one nation radio all things elite aw match guy podcast it's a little bit further back that ended but shouts out to sam um and also uh get in the ring uh and all danny shows but um yeah man appreciate you guys all rocking with me here on the twitch uh and you know we'll holla at y'all and um, check out, you know, some some of the stuff that I've been popping on the YouTube channel. Just uh, shot a, uh, a vlog for a new song I got called Fear Being Regular. I uh, got my album set to come out soon. Just finalizing the uh, track listing and, and the rollout and all that. So I have more information about that. But um, also, um, I'm going to be doing a very exciting thing um, over the weekend. I will tell you guys about it on Thursday. Um, And it's a great opportunity that's been afforded to me that I never imagined in a million years that this would happen. But shout out to Swerve Strickland. Uh, I will be joining his podcast uh, in the near future for a recording. And um, there is, I've said enough. I'll let you guys know on Thursday. So I'll get up out of here. Peace.
White Castle is offering Sloppy Joe sliders and mac and cheese nibblers for a limited time only. These offerings are the perfect comfort food for the season. Cravers and non-cravers alike will enjoy our three Sloppy Joe sliders and mac and cheese nibblers. Nothing says cozy like the Smoky Joe and Cheddar Cheese with crispy onions, the Spicy Joe with Jalapeno Cheese and Jalapeno Crisps, and the Sloppy Joe with the sweet and tangy flavor, and the crispy on the outside, creamy on the inside mac and cheese nibblers. Get the comfort food you crave at your nearest castle. Limited time only at participating castles.